men. Well, an accountability partner is, is a Christian who pairs up with, a, with another Christian in order to mutually edify and exhort one another in order to avoid sinful behaviors. And so we can actually supplement that. It is an absolute necessity to have, but we can supplement our accountability to others by reading slowly through literature designed to challenge our, our Christian maturity. Consider this example. Uh, these questions that I'm going to ask you that are related to sexual purity that actually I had to read pretty carefully as I read through Kent Hughes' uh, Liberating Ministry from the Success Syndrome. Question number one. Are we being desensitized by the present evil world? Do things that once shocked us now pass by without any notice at all? Have our, have our sexual ethics slacked? Have they laxed? Number two, where do our minds wander when we have no duties to perform? What do we dwell on? What do we think about? Number three, what are we reading? Are the books or the magazines or the files in our libraries things that we don't want out anyone else to see? Question number four, what are we renting at the local video store? What are we downloading? What are we, what are we looking at on, on pay-per-view? How many hours do we spend watching TV? How many adulteries did we watch last week? How many murders do we watch? How many did we watch with our children? Question number five. How many chapters in the Bible did we read last week? Folks, we need to understand that in God's eyes, there are no degrees of sin. They're all on the same level, all of them. And so our goal today is to realize that committing sin in our hearts is no different than carrying it out in reality. To better understand what I'm talking about, if you will turn with me to the book of Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew. As we continue our study in the Gospel of Matthew, we're in chapter 5 today, looking at verse 27 and following. Matthew chapter 5, verse 27 says this, Jesus speaking. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it's better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it's better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body go into hell. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. As we continue our study in the Gospel of Matthew, of course we know uh, all of us are here regularly every week. Uh, and I'm very thankful for your faithfulness in that, that we're looking at the Sermon on the Mount. Of course, Matthew writes his gospel directing it at Israel in order to demonstrate to Israel that Jesus Christ is, in fact, their promised Messiah. Jesus Christ is Messiah. He is the Christ. He is the Savior of the world. And he also has fulfilled every single one of the Old Testament prophecies that speak of Messiah. And so Matthew uses that to demonstrate bringing those forward and showing folks that Jesus Christ has in fact fulfilled all of those prophecies. As we look at the Sermon on the Mount, you notice that I've called it our Kingdom Life Discourse. Why do I call it that? The reason I call it that, friends, is because it is not this pie-in-the-sky ideal of all possible worlds. It is an instruction guide. It is a blueprint, if you will, for the Christian life. And Jesus Christ demonstrates that by the way that he calls his disciples to him at the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount. He calls them to him. He sits down in a manner that a rabbi would do in order to teach his followers, his disciples, if you will, what he would like them to do. And if you remember, as we were going through the book of Matthew, Jesus called his disciples. He said, come follow me. He didn't mean just come, come hang out. I want to be your friend. What he's saying when he says, come follow me, if you look at it in the original language, what he means is, come and watch what I do and model yourself the way that I live my life. Do as I do. 
do as I say, yes, but also do, do as I do. And so as we look at the Sermon on the Mount, as we look at our passage today, we really need to go back and, and dissect it just a little bit. If you will, look at verse 27 with me. Notice the text says, you have heard that it was said. And as we look at these different passages, as we looked at last week, as we looked at anger, as we look at lust this week, as we look at oaths and retaliation and loving your enemies and giving to the needy and, and how to pray and laying up your treasures in heaven and not being anxious, you'll notice that Jesus repeats those that statement, you have heard that it was said. And what he is stating here, friends, is that this is something, a directive from God to God's people. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. And of course, we know this is in the Ten Commandments. This is one of the, one of the big ten, right? You shall, and every, everybody knows when you, when you make that statement in the, in the Ten Commandments, it's, it's something that's a, a directive. And you'll, you'll see that Jesus repeats himself, you've heard that it was said this, but I say to you this. You have heard that it was said this, but I say to you this. Look what he says. You, you have heard that it was said you shall not commit adultery, but I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Now, before we go on, I want to I want to rewind back to a, a couple of sermons ago when we were talking about that Jesus said that he had not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill the law. And at the end of it, look what he says here in verse 20, just a couple of verses back. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of the guidelines that he sets forth. And so we, we studied that as we were looking at, at, at the passage where he says, I, I've not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. But at the end of it, he says, I tell you the truth, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Why does he say that? He says that because the statement says that we cannot work our way into the kingdom. Everybody looked at, at, at Jesus when he said that and said, say what? Because you see, the scribes and the Pharisees, the Sanhedrin, the governing body of Israel in the first century, obeyed the law perfectly. They followed all the rules. They followed all the guidelines. And in fact, they were accountable to it to the point where they were policing everyone else to make sure that everyone followed the guidelines and punished people when they didn't follow them. So what Jesus has to do after making that audacious statement, that outrageous statement, is that he has to qualify it. So he qualifies it first by talking about anger. First he says, you've heard it said that you shall not murder, but I say to you, if you're angry with your brother, you've already committed murder. You know, we were having some conversations on, on Wednesday, and, and uh, we, we, were, we were looking at it saying, well, how, how many people did you murder this week? How many did you murder this week? Because you see, friends, if we're, if we're angry, if we're even impatient, as the text tells us, if we even say, you idiot, then we've, we've committed murder. And so Jesus is qualifying his statement by saying, it's a matter of the heart. It's no different. It's no different if you commit these things in your heart than if you, if you committed them in reality. And so the text tells us today... But I say to you, everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. It's no different. It's no different. You know, we, we look at that, that, that phrase, uh, adultery, and, and, and we see it. But I want to re us to remember Jesus' response to it. Of course, you remember that, uh, that some of the, the Pharisees tried to trip Jesus up by setting up a situation where they could catch somebody in the act. And so they take this woman that they caught in the act of adultery and they drag her in front of Jesus. Conspicuously, the man is not there. Of course, the law says that, that both, are, both that, that commit this action are supposed to be stoned to death. Conspicuously, the man is absent. Nevertheless, the woman is dragged before Jesus. They think, aha, we've got it. We've got it. So Jesus says this. He, he bends down, he draws the ground, he stands up and he says, let he who is out without sin cast the first stone. And the text tells us that one by one, beginning with the elders, with the oldest people that were there, they begin to leave. And Jesus bends down and he writes in the sand, again, 
you know, one of the questions that I'm going to ask him when I want to see him is, what did you write? What did you write? Who knows? He knows. But he stands back up, and, no, and everyone's gone except for he and the woman. And he says, woman, where, where are your accusers? Who, who is here to condemn you? And she says, no one, Lord. And listen to what he says. He says, neither do I condemn you, but go and sin no more. And friends, I want us to take that as a blueprint. I want us to look at the, these passages as we see them, because you see, every one of us is a murderer. Every one of us is an adulterer. Every one of us has broken oaths. Every one of us has thought in their heart retaliation. Every one of us has hated our enemies. Every one of us is, is in violation. And that's Jesus' point. When he says, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you, you cannot, we can't work our way into the kingdom. We can never be perfect. And in fact, even if we could be perfect from now on, we haven't been perfect before. And so, we cannot earn our way into the grace of God. It is by His grace, by His sovereign grace choice for you and I, what He does. And so when Jesus looks at this and when He says, you should, it, you've heard it said, you should not commit adultery, but I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. What is He saying? Every one of us is guilty of that. Every one of us, every last one of us is guilty of that. Every last one of us is guilty of anger and, in fact, as a result, guilty of murder. So he goes on to qualify this. And what he uses here, friends, and I want us to, to see this for what it is, because uh, Origen and some of the early church fathers, when they were studying the Bible, they, they, they did not understand the component of figurative language in the Bible. Very often, very often when we read the Bible, we see figurative language. And we need to understand that figurative language is a way to communicate illustrations, word pictures that may be difficult in concept to understand or take more words than are, are necessary to explain. And so this is figurative language when, when Jesus says, if your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. He's not literally saying to tear your eye out. What is he talking about? What, what are our eyes? Our eyes are the window to our soul, friends. Our eyes are the lamp of the body. And what goes in through our eyes go into our brain, and, the, and perhaps you've heard the, the statement before, there, and once you've seen something, you can't unsee it. it everything that we see, everything that, 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 that pours into our bodies and into our minds, enters through our eyes and through our ears and our, our, our senses, friends. And so what Jesus is saying is, if there are things in your life that are pouring into your mind that cause you to stumble, that cause you to sin, get rid of them. Get rid of those things. Don't go to that place. Don't go with that person. Don't watch that show. Don't see that. Don't be, don't be found in places where you will be tempted to commit sin. And he goes on to illustrate it even more in hyperbolic language. It's an exaggeration to, to make a point. But last, last Wednesday I, I was talking about that and I say, you know, because I study the Bible so often that I, I do a lot of that. I do a lot of hyperbolic things, you know, and my, my lovely wife calls me on it all the time. It's like there weren't a million of them. There, there was just a lot, right? So the Bible does it, so I'll do it, right? <laughs> Amen. <laughs> so as, as he hyperbolically says, if your right hand offends you, cut it off. Well, what, that, that metaphor there is, is the things we're doing. If, if there are things that you and I are doing that are causing us to stumble, don't go there. Stop. Refrain from, from doing these things. Hold, hold off. Go, go somewhere. Don't hang with that person anymore. You know, we're, we're called to be light in a dark place. We're called to be the influencers. Yes. And we're, we're, we're in the world, but we're not of the world. We are called to be influencers. But we, if, if we become the influencee in a relationship, we need to end that. Or we need to flip the, flip the thing around. We need to turn the tables and make ourselves be the influencers. You know, that's why Jesus was talking about a couple, a couple of sermons back, a couple of verses back here. 
that if salt loses its saltiness, it's no good. You see, if we have these relationships where we ruined our witness with the person, and we try to flip it back around and be the influencer, it's like, well, you're just as bad as me. In fact, you're even worse than I am, right? It's all, it's all about the heart. It's all about what, what Jesus is talking about here, friends, is to not place ourselves in circumstances where temptation will seem overwhelming. And so he, he ends it with talking about it's better to do that than for your whole body to go into hell. Well, perhaps you say, well, you know, I just, I just really don't struggle with sexual lust. You know, each one of us, we, we all have general propensities towards certain types of sin. You know, Adam and Eve's DNA is in every, every one of us. But, but, that, but that split different ways. And so you, you may struggle with this thing and I may struggle. I may not struggle with that. You may struggle with another certain thing and I may not struggle. I may struggle with something that you may not struggle with. So maybe you say, I, I just don't really struggle with, with sexual lust. Well, a recent survey of discipleship journal readers ranked areas of greatest spiritual challenge for them. You know what number one was? And no surprise at all. Materialism. Materialism. I mean, what, in fact, if we look at the definition of lust, it's this, I have to have that. I have to have it, and I have to have it now, and I have to have the best of it, and the most of it, and more, and more, and more, and more, you know, and more is never enough. More is never enough. Materialism. This, and of course, it's bombarding us all of the time, isn't it? We're, we're bombarded with choices and options and all these kind of things. And the nicer thing, oh, we've got to have the best car with all the best features and the best clothes and, and eat at the best restaurants and do all the best things and go to the best vacations and more and more and more and more. But more is never enough. The hunger, the desire to be fed. Number two, pride. Pride. What is pride, really? Pride is that, 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 that part of us that says, you know, everything would be better if everyone would just listen to me. <laughs> you know, the world is so messed up. Think, you know, look at these people. My goodness, if they would just do this, then everything would be what? Why are they, oh my goodness. If everyone would just do what I say. And everything would be great. Everything would be wonderful. That pride. Or, or this desire to be of, of, of who I am. You know, of course, that, that was really, ultimately, that was the first, the first sin. Because you see, Satan was the worship leader for all, for all of heaven and all, all of, of God's followers in, in heaven. And for a fleeting moment, he said, this would be awesome if it was for me. It was for me. Ultimately, friends, pride is that inward focus of it's all about me. Instead of it's all about him. It's all about him. You know, there's a, a, a modern song that says it's all about you, Jesus. It's not about me. As if you should do things my way. You alone are God and I surrender to your way. Flip that pride. Number three, self-centeredness. You know, that's, that's, that's the, the, really the root of pride is that, that self-centeredness or maybe just self-centricness. You know, there's a difference between self-centeredness. Self-centeredness, I'm, I'm taking actions to, to, to serve me. Self-centricness is that I just am completely oblivious to anybody else's needs but mine. Number three. Number four, laziness. Laziness. Ah, you know, that, that, that farmer says, you know, uh, one of these days I'm going to fix that leaky roof. I mean, after all, it's not raining right now, so there's really not a problem. And it's raining. He's like, well, you know, I'm going to fix it as soon as it stops raining. <laughs> Laziness. There's a tie here between anger and bitterness and sexual lust. There's a tie between uh, there at number five, num number, and, and I'll skip over to number seven, envy. Oftentimes we, we, we mistake envy for jealousy. Jealousy is 
the concern that something that is ours is going to be taken from us, whereas envy is our desire to have what someone else has. You know, we look around and we see all of these, these nice things that other people have, and we desire them for ourselves. I, I want that. I should have that. Number eight, America, gluttony. Gluttony. This, this desire for, for all of this fantastic food, you know, when they bring these huge portions to you there at the restaurant, and, oh, Lord, it was so expensive, you just really don't want to waste any of it, right? Just keep on, oh, we've got to have dessert, right? I mean, the meal's not complete without dessert. Gluttony. Number nine, lying. You know, I think, I think number nine is probably higher, but I just think a lot of people were lying when they were asked about it. <laughs> anyway. So, so these survey respondents noted temptations were more, listen, this is critical, listen. Temptations were more potent when they had neglected their time with God. 81% said that temptations were more potent when they neglected their time with God, their daily quiet time. And when they were physically tired. 57% said when they were physically tired that it was just, it was easier to, to, fall, to fall victim to it. How many of us are getting our eight hours of sleep? Resisting temptation, on the other hand, was accomplished by prayer. 84% said resisting temptation was, was more potent when they had an avid daily time of prayer. And avoiding compromising situations, 76% said just avoiding those places, avoiding those compromising situations helped to resist. 66% said that Bible study was a, a major contributing factor in being accountable to someone. 52% said that being accountable to someone, someone who knows, knows those websites you go to, knows those shows that you watch, knows those places you go, and that you're accountable to, really helped with the avoiding of temptation. What is, what is temptation? I mean, temptation, friends, is not sin. We're, even Jesus was tempted, yet without sin. Temptation is not sin. Temptation is seduction to evil. It's solicitation to do wrong. It stands distinguishing from trial. See, see, the Lord will try you, but the Lord will not tempt you. He'll try you, but He will not tempt you. So trials and tests seek to discover our moral qualities or our character, but temptation persuades to evil. It deludes that it may bring us to ruin. The one means to undeceive, the other to deceive. The one aims at man's good, making him conscious of his true moral self, but the other at his evil, leading him to more or less unconsciously go into sin. God tries, Satan tempts. You know, 1 Corinthians 10.13, I would certainly memorize this text. 1 Corinthians 10.13 says, No temptation has overtaken you, but such as is common to man. And God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with the temptation will provide the means of escape also, so that you may be able to endure it. What, is it, what do we learn from this, friends? Well, sin is predictable. No temptation is overtaking you, but such as is common to man. It simply means this. You can never say, I'm the only one. This has never happened to anyone before. Sin is predictable. Sin is avoidable. And God is faithful who will not allow you to tempt you beyond what you're able. Sin is escapable. And with the temptation will provide the means of escape also so that you may be able to endure it. Oh, friends, oftentimes you'll have people that will misquote this and say, oh, the Lord will ne never give you more than you can handle. That's not what this says. Yes, He will. He will smash your world to show you that you can't do it. Because you see, that's will worship, friends. For us to do it in our own power is will worship. And He will smash you to pieces to let you know that you have to throw your hands up and say, oh, God, help me. Because apart from you, we can do nothing. But no temptation has overtaken you. But such as is common to man, and he is faithful to not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able. And he will provide the means of escape so that you can endure it. Remember this. Now I use a seminary word. It's called the noetic effects of sin. The noetic effects of sin. That means that sin begins in the mind. 
It begins with what we mull over in our mind and what we plan to do and what we intend to do. It always begins there. You know, in, in the book of Daniel, we, we read that Daniel, that Daniel realized this. And he said, and the text tells us, and Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself. In other words, in, in advance, he purposed in his heart in advance, not going to do it. Now, there he is, a teenager, amongst a whole bunch of other teenagers. Nope. And the people in charge are going, hey, eat, drink, be merry, do whatever you want. Most teenagers would go, woohoo, right? But what does Daniel say? He says, no, not going to do it. Not going to do it. Purposing in our heart in advance, friends. Avoid those places. Avoid that thing. Avoid that person. Sin is escapable. It's escapable. Perhaps you've read, read Pilgrim's Progress. There's a scene from, from Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress that portrays an interpreter bringing a Christian to a wall where fire is blazing from a grate. A man's trying to douse the fire with water, and the interpreter shows the Christian the other side of the wall where another man is secretly pouring oil on the fire to keep it ablaze. The interpreter says, You saw the man standing behind the wall to maintain the fire, teaching you that it is hard for the tempted to see how this work of grace is maintained in the soul. Satan tries to quench faith, but Christ keeps that flame alive. He keeps it alive in you. Just to review, Jesus reminds his listeners concerning the commandment against adultery, but he says that if you do it in your heart, you've committed already. It's no different. He says that if your eye offends you, pluck it out. Metaphorically speaking, if you're, if you're seeing things you shouldn't see that are causing you to be tempted, don't watch that anymore. Don't go, don't go to those places anymore. Same thing with, with the hand. Cut your hand off as a metaphor. It means don't be busily doing the things that are going to cause you to fall into temptation because you see, he says it's better. It's better to limit yourself from these things than it is to go into hell, as he said. So what's our takeaway? What do we walk away with when, when, we, when we look at this passage today, when we realize that Jesus has provided us an escape, that he's provided us a way, we need to remember this. I've got a couple of points I want to share with you on that. In the Australian bush country grows this little plant called the sundew. It has a slender stem and, and tiny round leaves fringed, fringed with hairs that glisten with bright drops of liquid as delicate as fine dew. Woe to the insect, however, that dares to dance on it, although it's attractive in clusters of red, white, and pink blossoms. They look harmless, but the leaves are deadly. The shiny moisture on each leaf is sticky, and it will imprison any bug that touches it. As an insect struggle, struggles to get free, the vibration causes the leaves to close tightly around it. The innocent-looking plant feeds on its victim. I have a video I'd like us to watch that reinforces this point just a bit more. And so uh, if we could have the video.
starts small, doesn't it? And it grows and grows, and then you're caught, you're trapped. Seek the Lord. No temptation is overtaking you, but such as is common to man. And God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able. But with the temptation will provide the means of escape also so that you may be able to endure it. So here's my challenge. In our daily quiet time, and I hope you have a daily quiet time, as, as, I, as I shared with you, that is, that is your very most potential way of avoiding the things that might entrap us is to spend time with the Lord, spend time in the Word, and I hope you do that. 15 minutes a day, reading, studying the Scripture, praying to the Lord. Consider if there's anything in your life right now that's causing you to stumble into sin and remove it, no matter how painful it seems, will you do it? Let's pray.